Battery metals close the year with some big M&A and metals turn positive. You listen to Kick Around Table. I'm your host, Michael McRae. We have no Paul Harris, but we do have John Fennick. He's portfolio manager and founder of Fennick Consulting. John, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Likewise, Michael. Thanks for having me. Before we start, John, what's your holiday plans? Well, I've got a little nine-year-old daughter who's my world, so we're going to be uh, hanging out here and uh, just uh, relaxing and seeing family and friends. And How I about know, you? I, well, I, I, well, we're. Uh, I, I, I think your weather is going to be a little bit better. Uh, we're going to be uh, ducking the ice storm that's uh, happening up here in uh, Vancouver, uh, BC. Uh, of course, you're down in uh, Arizona, so um, uh, looking at the snow outside, uh, I think we plan to do uh, lots of baking. Um, uh, John, um, I want to mix up uh, the order uh, this week. Um, uh, sure. We usually start sure. with uh, macro, but um, I really want to get in a macro discussion with you because uh, it's been uh, such an important year and that's really going to set the trend for what's happening in 2023. So uh, let's switch the order first and I want to cover some mining headlines. Of course. Um, the world's largest miner, BHP, looks to be on its way to acquiring Oz Minerals. A deal has been upsized to $6.39 billion. For comparison, the Agnico Eagle Pan American Yamana deal was $4.8 billion. Oz Minerals has a nickel focus with operations in Australia. Forbes report that the acquisition could be BHP's biggest in over a decade. The deal follows the trend of big miners investing in battery metal space. Sabani Stillwater buying Ioneer and Caliber, and then Rio Tinto spending $2.4 billion on its Serbian lithium operation, Jadar. Last year, BHP Billiton lost the fight to acquire Norat Resources and its rich nickel project in Ontario. Keeping with the battery metal theme, Lithium Americas is set to acquire Arena Minerals for $227 million. CEO Jonathan Evans said that the transaction will consolidate development projects in Argentina. Lithium Americas plans to cut itself in two in 2023, with one of the companies focused on Latin America and the other in North America with the goal of unlocking value. And I am Gold traded up by a third this week when it announced a $340 million in additional funding for the construction of the Kote project. Funding comes from Sumitomo, which will get 10% of Kote. I am Gold also sold exploration development projects in Senegal, Mali, and Guinea to manage them for $282 million. I am Gold has been struggling with cost overruns for Kote. The company said that the project is 70% complete and on track for production in 2024. John, just to finish with miners, Ornick put some numbers on the dismal financing picture for juniors in 2022. Of course, with the tightening that we've had from the Fed, we've seen a real drying up of available funds for mine financing and also expiration financing. Ornick put some numbers on it and expects a total year-on-year -year drop in the number of financings to be down 20% whereas total dollars raised will come in 40% lower. Uh, Kai Hoffman, though, uh, talking about uh, where we are right now in November, seemed to think that there is a little bit of glimmers of hope or he sees some unthawing that is happening in November. John, how does the financing picture for juniors look to you? It's a mixed bag. Um, you know, uranium names have done a decent job of raising money in 2022 on the back of the rally from last year, um, I think that will continue into 2023. Uh, silver companies uh, really started to do okay starting in October. As you know, Michael, in October 3rd, we had silver up 9.1% to kick this rally off in one day. So, you know, we have been bullish on silver, um, you know, all year, mentioning twice on Kiko that the $18 an ounce level would hold. And I think it broke down to maybe 1760 ish. But Generally speaking, we're on our way to 25 an ounce now, and that's very positive for silver companies trying to raise money in 2023, in my view. Um, and, you know, gold companies, it's sort of, like I said, a mixed bag. It, it just depends on the company and the project, right, and the jurisdiction. There's a lot of things to consider, but uh, I, I don't see the capital markets locking up here at all. I mean, at, at this juncture, I do think there is a risk in 2023 or 24 of a black swan event like a Lehman where you get a bank that goes under uh, or you know really gets close uh, and and then you might see some some difficulty in terms of raising funds whether it's mining or elsewhere
I, you know, the black swan uh, was uh, supposed to uh, be uh, coming from crypto or some people were expecting that. But, um, you know, as is that, uh, you know, as that sector was uh, growing so large, but, um, you know, kind of the downturn in it or the downturn, it wasn't kind of it as a size where it could kind of cause uh, a, a general um, a contagion. But um, that's interesting, John, you're uh, seeing that uh, there's still um, there's uh, still more um, shoes to drop. Yeah, if you look at, uh, you know, Wells Fargo, WFC, it's been in a downtrend for a number of weeks now. The news flow is not positive, in my view, although Morgan and some other companies just upgraded the stock. I, I just, you know, I'm taking the other side of that trade uh, because the pandemic low on Wells is around 2015 and it's trading at 41 bucks. So, you know, when you double the pandemic low, think about, you know, uh, AU and Newmont NEM and a couple of these names that actually broke the March 2020 low in our sector, right? And to me, they're way higher quality than, than Wells Fargo. And, you know, looking at the entire specter, spectrum of opportunities as a portfolio manager to invest in. Let's talk a little bit about uh, metal prices and where we are right now, John. Um, gold is back above 1800 and silver is at the $23 level. A senior market analyst and columnist Jim Wyckoff wrote that the precious metals are supported by technical buying as the near-term chart is bullish for both metals. Stronger than expected U.S. economic data on Thursday was a wake-up call to traders and investors that the Federal Reserve is unlikely to stop financing U.S. monetary policy until well into 2023. Better gross domestic product reports also suggest that the U.S. economy is not ready to slip into recession. Other key market indicators, the U.S. dollar index was a bit weaker. NYMEX crude oil prices are up and trading around $79 a barrel. Meantime, the yield on the benchmark U.S. 10-year Treasury note is presently 3.714%. Uh, John, uh, what camp are you in? Are you in a hard landing, soft landing, no landing? Hard landing. Yeah, I, I think uh, the Fed, you know, we, we've been saying on Kitco since June and, and publicly since March that we thought that the Fed was going to be hawkish this year. And we've, you know, tried to position appropriately while trying to remain, you know, decently invested, of course, as a, as a, as a portfolio manager. One of the risks is you're not invested and then November 4th happens and then, you know, the market has taken off and you're you're scrambling to get positions on. Um, but I think that when you look at the Fed Watch tool, which is produced by CME online, CME Watch, uh, Fed Watch tool right now is showing February 1st a 32% probability of a 50 basis point hike, a 22% probability of a 50 basis point hike in March, and then it virtually like a 2 or 3% probability in May. So we're seeing that is is positive to some of your guests, you know, in terms of them saying, look, you know, we're, we're going to get this Fed flip flop. Believe me, I want that. I'm just looking at data like you just pointed out, GDP beating estimates yesterday at, you know, 3.2 percent up versus 2.9 percent up. And that is going to give the Fed more uh, ammunition, in my view, to stay hawkish. Right. Like, I mean, <laughs> We have to be uh, data dependent because that's what the Fed is, uh, you know, talking up, right? I mean, CPI is coming in January, non-farm payrolls is coming in January. These are important metrics uh, to watch uh, as we move forward in terms of getting an idea of where the Fed's headed. But you know, right now, I think the the flip flop is still. I've been saying February to May all year. I think. It's probably still in that you know area where you know May's meeting hopefully is where they stop or you know it, it, it's you know many of your guests have said cuts. I mean cut rates is like an all-in moment, right? When you see the Fed cut, you know that they've gone over their skis, and to me that's when you go in with both fists. But right now that we're not there. I, isn't the counter to that, uh, John? Isn't uh, that the markets, uh, what they're doing right now? Because, um, you know, uh, things have been really on a tear since uh, the lows that we had in the fall. Yeah, I mean, I I'm, I'm trying to invest in higher quality names uh, throughout the fall, um, as well as some mixed with juniors that I think have promise for next year, right? So it's a balanced mm -hmm. approach. Um, I would feel much more uh, bullish about the names in GDX and GDXJ, you know, where we have $14 billion if if the we get a, a really big signal, right? And a big signal to me is we break out of the gold channel of 1750 to 1850 an ounce. We break this this $25 mark on silver, which is major resistance, right? And then you're looking at 27 to 28 from there. That would be bullish, you know, but I want to see those things happen. Give me 
give me more confidence as an investor before I'm going to take that risk on. Uh, what level do you think that the Fed is going to reach next year, John? Well, I think the dot plot just suggested another 75 bips next year. I, I think that's very probable. Um, and, you know, that would put us, I guess, over that 5% mark, right? So like, um, you know, no one was really talking 5% at the beginning of this year, right? And now, you know, it's a real reality for 2023. Um, and, and so I think, you know, we just have to watch, you know, Fed, when you look at Powell's comments, November second, I guess that was, to me, that was his most hawkish, uh, you know, presser that we've seen all year. So that was literally six weeks ago. I don't think we're out of the woods yet. I think we're getting closer to being out of the woods. But like I said, you know, it's, there's so many values out there in the mining space right now. There's really not a heck of a lot of rush as we end tax law season here. How long is the Fed going to be able to keep the rates elevated, John? I'm not sure. Um, I think, uh, like I said, I think the the flip flop to me is them pausing rather than cutting. You know, I think that's that's where you really want to get interested in buying. You know, the broad market, and, and you know, as I've said, you know, with uh, you last last month, Michael. You know, we we are about thirteen percent short. That that position will increase if we start to see the major indices break uh, a bit more as we enter Q one. Um, but I would cover probably all of my short positions if the Fed were to cut, but I'll cover a lot of them if they start to pause. I, I guess then uh, right now, um, are you keeping your um, are you keeping your powder dry right now, John? Because uh, you're just looking that uh, there's going to be some more deals that are going to be coming on uh, the table in the uh, 2023. Yeah, and we can talk about some equity ideas that have near term news that they've publicly telegraphed. Right. I mean, that's yeah. that's what I'm keeping some powder dry for is. You know, why buy something that may have news, you know, in April or May now? I mean, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a long time with the Fed doing what they're doing right now. Um, I want to keep cash on hand and try to deploy that closer to the time that these companies are talking about their PEA, their feasibility study, whatever that catalyst is that they see uh, for 2023. Let's uh, let's uh, get it into it right now. Um, I mean, gold has uh, certainly been a um, highlight uh, here at the end with uh, the couple of the breaks uh, into the 1800. Uh, what do you think uh, works in the precious metal market? Is this something that you're looking at now, John, or is there something that you can see that'll be uh, better in 2023? Sure. So, you know, in the gold space, we have been buying a lot of juniors here. Um, the only major we've bought recently is AEM because the chart looks beautiful um, and it really took off and it's been acting as a leader within the space. Um, but in the junior space, we bought Ascendant Resor uh, Resources recently, which is ASDRF and a new position for us. Um, you know, they're in Portugal. They've got a feasibility study coming by March 31st and they have an IRR on that project of 55% right now with an NPV of about 250 million. So, you know, to me, that looks extremely uh, cheap here at 14 cents US. Um, another in the gold space that we've mentioned on your show before, USAU, which is US gold, you know, 100% US exposure. You know, they're waiting on permitting next year for their Copper King project, which they call CK in Wyoming. And, you know, Wyoming, I think, gets a bad rap. Uh, you know, it's not in Idaho. It's not in Nevada, I guess, but it's it's going to be fine. You know, it's, it's Wyoming. That I've met a lot of the politicians there. They want the project. And, and when you look at where the project is located, it's three miles away uh, from a huge player in the commodity space. Um, and, it, you know, who knows if they just take the project over because, you know, as you just pointed out earlier in this interview, um, you know, there's companies that are on, on the major side taking over the mid cap and small cap names. I think that M&A activity is going to continue into next year. Um, and and lastly, uh, you know, in the gold space, there's um, another one that I really, you know, think is, is, is thinly traded, but underfollowed by uh, by investors. And that's Thunder Mountain Gold, uh, which is THMG. You know, it's been in Idaho since 1935. Uh, they have a project called South Mountain that they're uh, JV'd with B metals on. And I think there's just a lot of value there when you look at a stock that's gone from 33 cents to six cents, um, you know, in, in a matter of, you know, the pandemic, excuse me, the March 2020 high to now. 
Uh, some of these things are really getting bombed out, Michael, as you know, in the junior space. You know, moving to silver, um, I pointed out that some of these companies had some success in raising funds. I've mentioned SilverX on your program before, um, AGXPF. They did a financing in October right on the back of that silver rise, perfectly timed in my view. Um, and their you know, numbers have been decent uh, on, the, on the revenue side um, year over year. Uh, Aftermath Silver really looks good here to me. Again, a Peruvian name, but also Chilean. Uh, project and um, you know they're going to have news that they publicly telegraphed probably by end of Q1 just like Ascendant. So you know we're looking at names like this that are going to have something coming um, in the next three to six months rather than a year to three years down the road because it's too hard for me to view what the world looks like in one to three years, right? You know, so we're trying to invest that way. And lastly, in the in the silver space, uh, gold and minerals would fit that bill. They've talked about. Their joint venture with Barrick here very little since um, doing this deal in Q1 of uh, three years ago. Gosh, so you know Barrick is going to have some drill results on El Cavar, which is their Argentinian project, and I think that uh, that might be a catalyst for the stock. Um, also, they need silver to be you know between 20 and 22 to get excited about restarting Valerdania. And now that we're at 23 plus, um, I think the investors are missing the fact here at 27 cents the stock could be worth a lot more once they either put Velardania back into production or El Cabar gets some good drill results. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, Agnico Eagle because it's been trading noticeably higher above uh, the GDX, uh, especially uh, since uh, you know investors really seem to like that deal that uh, they're going to be doing with uh, acquiring uh, Yamana, uh, the deal that they did uh, with Pan American. Uh, I started at the top, uh, John, uh, talking about uh, critical metals. Uh, maybe you talk sure. a little bit in that space, what you think works. Yeah, um, I love that space. You know, as a portfolio manager here, Michael, I compete with a lot of people that really focus on gold and silver only. And we have been agnostic to the metal in every name that we own uh, for the last, you know, almost seven years. We'll have our seven year track record on January 1st. Um, and for that reason, you know, when you look at copper, you know, in, in, in May of uh, 2020, we got excited after the pandemic started by Copper Juniors. We started with the majors, right? COPX which is the ETF for the larger cap copper names. That was what the first thing that we bought. We bought FCX, which is a leader, Freeport, McMoran. But then we went down in capitalization and started to go after some of these small and mid cap names. You know, one that comes to mind right now is, is World Copper. Um, World Copper is trading at 10 cents. I mean, either of their project is worth 10 cents in my view. So it's, it's, it's just like some of these names in, in copper, cobalt, nickel, so, you know, just gotten so bombed out that you know, there's just tremendous value there. Um, looking just at the critical metal space, though, I'll give you a couple um, that I'm looking at right now. I think uh, Group 10, uh, formerly known as Group 10 now, Stillwater Critical, um, that is PGEZF. Um, their rocks are attached to Sabanier's rocks in Montana. So when you look at the geology, I've owned Sabanier for years. Um, they're eventually going to need to increase their production profile, right? And so why not do it with a junior that's literally next door? I'm not saying it's a done deal, but I would say that they're very interested because they have produced a ton at Stillwater, which is the former SWC. Uh, that deal was totally you know, poo-pooed back in the day because of the price that they paid for Stillwater, but now no one's laughing because you know, Stillwater has been a beast. And, and, you know, when you have a company like Stillwater trading at 12 cents connected to those rocks, I don't know how you, you know, lose much money in a name like that. Um, another one that is transforming itself into a critical metal, uh, critical minerals company is uh, Idaho Champ, which I mentioned with you last month at three cents. Uh, it's trading above four cents now. Um, I think, you know, it hit seven cents in September. I think it's going to retest that level next year. So that's a really nice percentage gain there. And I think that because they've they've expanded into um, cobalt and lithium this year, right? So they're trying to get away from just being a, a traditional gold junior and move into other areas that can produce value for shareholders. Lastly, John, uh, it's uh, at the end of the year. Uh, top trend that you're looking forward to in 2023? Well, that's difficult. Uh, top trend. Well, I think um, the trend for me is going to be that the broad market is going to sell off more than people think in the first half. 
um, that will create a what we, what we call a sector rotation. And one of the sectors that will get some love is going to be mining um, because you pointed out, you know, uh, or echoed my comments on AEM. Um, there's so many names that are just starting to break out a little bit in the mining space. Portfolio managers are watching this. I don't think they're very interested right now because it's year end and they're just trying to lick their wounds from owning Amazon and Meta and all this other stuff on the momentum side. But when we get into a year like next year, Michael, where there's going to be still a lot of you know um, talk around the Fed's actions, I think there's just going to be a, a movement towards our sector because it really hasn't caught a significant bid since August of 2020. So, you know, it, it, when you look at 28 months plus of pain, you know, for investors, um, portfolio managers on the value side are going to take notice of our sector next year. And that's going to be the biggest trend is, is, you know, it could be kind of not as big as 2016, where we had a lot of short interest going into that rally. But I think it could be at least half of that. And, and that's very exciting. I think uh, the top trend I'm going to be looking at is going to be uh, China, John. Um, you know, we're uh, they've uh, done uh, they've lifted their policy on uh, zero COVID, but um, you know, with Xi uh, Jinping's ascension right now, uh, we've really seen that uh, trade and uh, innovation are just being stifled because you have the growing state control in uh, the country. Um, you know, there's some commentators are wondering if you know if uh, China's best days are behind it, and of course, China is just a monster. Uh, in the resource space. Um, that's it for me. Follow me at Twitter. That's Michael McCray with two C's. John, how can people get a hold of you? Sure. It's uh, fenicconsulting.com. Uh, my personal email is john.fenick at yahoo.com. And I try to be uh, as responsive as I can even during the holidays. Um, we have a newsletter that we'd love to, you know, get out to more of the generalist type, type investors that covers all commodities. Um, so we wrote on that gas recently. We wrote on uh, critical minerals like we just talked about. You know, I'm not just gold and silver. And uh, I think, you know, we're entering a period right now uh, where commodities could really take off. Roundtable. We'll take a break next week. We will see everyone in the new year. Have a merry, merry Christmas. Day.